Lucy and Lenny again. We're talking about Unit 3, um, Purpose Clauses. I don't think anybody thinks of purpose clauses as a grammatical thing unless you start learning Greek and Latin. Um, so so what, what the heck is a purpose clause? First, maybe we should talk about clause as a concept because it's different from a sentence. A clause, there are dependent clauses and independent clauses. Um, in grammar, a, a clause is a, that's, that's independent can stand by itself. Um, and a dependent clause is what a purpose clause is. It it's a, it's consists of a sentence, but it has to be attached to another sentence. Okay. Um, an example of an independent clause. Well, we'll come to them. <laughs> okay. Um, so so let's Greek distinguishes between between uh, various kinds of clauses. We're talking about how you put sentences together. How you make sentences that are more complex than today is Thursday, or that's an elephant, and stuff like that. Um, so a purpose clause describes the intention of an action that you are um, uh, uh, specifying in the main sentence. So if the main sentence is, um, we, we are going home today, um, what the purpose clause can do is express the reason or the intention that you have for doing that. Not the reason, but your intention in doing it. What, why, why you're going home. So we're going home today in order to, um, um, you know, clean house. Buy a bag of peanuts. Do something or other. Okay, some kind of goal uh, that that expresses an intention. And because it's, it's a sentence like that. We're going home today is fine. That's a that's a fact statement that goes in the indicative. But in order to buy a bag of peanuts, that's not indicative. That's what your intent is, okay? And you might not realize it, right? Um, so it becomes a matter of moods. And um, in in Greek, there are the two moods, the subjunctive and the optative, and they are um, systematically. Um, we, we had that little extra video for you in which I showed you that there's a continuum from the true, which is the indicative, to the false, the admittedly false, which is the unreal uh, form, which is actually a kind of subset of the indicative, okay? And in between, we have the subjunctive closer to the indicative and the optative closer to the false, okay? Um, so systematically in, in the language, these are uh, that, that difference between what's more real and what's less real, or what's more true and what's less true, um, govern the choice between the subjunctive and an optative. So how does that work in the case of purpose clauses? Well, this is a little bit surprising, I think, but if the main sentence is, uh, has an unaugmented verb, like we are going home, or we have finished speaking, okay, um, or some some present uh, tense group indicative verb form, then you use the subjunctive because it's talking about what's happening right now. If you if you have an augmented verb form like a pluperfect or a imperfect or an aorist, then you have to use the optative because it's it's the possibility is we went home in order that we might buy a bag of peanuts. It's farther removed from reality. Okay, from a from a, a certain point of view, that's the grammatical point of view of the language. It might not be philosophically so, okay, but grammatically speaking, your intention in the past is less real than intention in the present. It's not that crazy, nope. right? So, so that's why um, purpose clauses that are whose main sentence, the sentence that they are dependent upon, have present tense verbs or future also works, okay. If it's a future verb and you and then you add, to add a purpose clause to it, then you're going to use a subjunctive. Whereas if it's a if it's a nearest, an imperfect or a pluperfect, you're going to use the subjunctive. I mean the optative. So um, we we there's one other or two other details about the way this works. One is that you have a choice in any given case if you're a, an ancient Greek between the aorist optative or subjunctive, and the so-called present optative or subjunctive. And what makes you choose one or the other? Well, it's a matter of the aspect, okay? Mm -hmm. um, 
one in the example that I give, which I think is the most common kind of purpose clause in English and the in order to clause, we use an infinitive. But you can reconstruct that. And I think in order to understand the way Greek does it, you need to reconstruct. We, we went home in order to buy a bag of peanuts. You can say something like, we went home in order that we might buy a bag of peanuts, mm -hmm. right? Spell it out with, as a real sentence with, a, with, a, with a, a subject and a verb, in order that we might buy a bag of peanuts. And it's cumbersome, but that's the way Greek does it. It doesn't use an infinitive the way we do in English. It uses these moods, okay, because it's talking about things that aren't real. Um, so what you what you do is if if you if you if you say in order that we might buy a bag of peanuts which which mood would you use would you use the subjunctive i mean the, the the aorist or the present in that case you'd use the aorist okay um if you wanted to say we went home in order that we might try to buy a bag of peanuts begin buying a bag of peanuts start the process of buying a bag of peanuts then you'd use the the present it's really not the base form okay I think you have to have a reason to use a, um, a so-called present form of the subjunctive or the optative. So you're going to see a lot more aorist optatives and subjunctives than you're going to see um, uh, uh, present ones. Last thing to, is that you uh, Greek is a language which has two ways of saying not, okay? Um, and it uses these to help you identify constructions too, okay? So, so this is the adverb that negates a sentence, as in, I like peanuts, I do not like peanuts, is that not, okay? We just have one word, that's not. And Greek has two, there's one that you already learned, that's ou, which can also be ouk with a kappa, or ouk with a ki, okay, depending on what kind of a, of a, a word follows it, okay? In other words, that's already, notice it's a word without an accent. Um, but it becomes part of the word that follows it. Okay, it's closely you know, allied to the next word or the next grammatical uh, unit of content in sense. Okay, it doesn't go backwards, it goes forwards, right? Just like not, well, uh, yeah, not mostly does that in English. Okay, and then, but the other negative is me, mu, eta, and it has an accent. Okay, um, it doesn't change its form in any shape, way, shape or form. But here's a general rule about when to use one or the other. It's pretty simple. U negates facts, things that are real, indicatives, okay? And me negates things that are hypothetical. Um, not, not things that are false, okay? But things that are hypothetical. And that's, that's the last piece. So a purpose clause is going to have may as its negative. So we are going home so that we, we might, may not buy a bag of peanuts. Is again, you're gonna have may and not All right, so helps you know what you're looking at. Belisa, you're out of the picture. Sorry. <laughs> okay, we're done.